Okay, so I come from nothing, right? We all come from the Big Bang, you know? We come from nothing, and eventually I'm going to return to nothing. And follow me on Twitter from nothing. Um, so on December 10th, 2010, I became homeless, and I was terrified. But I had my smartphone. Uh, my ex-wife, through a, a, a wonderful um, gift, allowed me to keep this smartphone and use it while I was homeless. So in the mornings, I would stay at Starbucks between 7 and 10 because the um, shelter I was in would, would close at 7 and I had nowhere to go. Excuse me, between 7 and 9. We didn't have anywhere to go, but because I had a Starbucks gold card, I could stay in Starbucks and keep warm, safe, and dry. And so I started tweeting about what there wasn't for homeless people, what there wasn't for me. I had food stamps and that was about it. And so as I'm tweeting about these things that aren't there for homeless people, I'm, I'm staying warm, safe, and dry in my own Starbucks. It's the Starbucks where I was from, where I lived, and I was running out of money, and I didn't know what I was going to do, so I tweeted out there, help, I need um, somewhere to go between 7 and 9. No one ever came up with a way to do that. People all around the world following me on Twitter didn't have any means, couldn't think of anything for me to do, but what they did do is they refilled my gold card. That allowed me then to just keep kind of bitching and complain. Now I need shoes. Toms donate shoes to kids around the world. Does anybody donate shoes to people who are homeless? Boots, winter boots. I needed winter boots. So I just asked, you know, does anybody know? And again, nobody knew who could donate um, winter boots or who did it. But somebody decided that they would help me and give me a little money to get some winter boots. And then it dawned on me I could help other people who had small needs. So in the shelter, my next tweet was, I need a pair of black combat boots, but they have to be vegan for a 15-year-old girl in my shelter. And within minutes, I had people um, from around the world responding to that tweet and laughing about what are vegan, you know, boots. And um, a woman named Abby, uh, Abby Likes on uh, Twitter, the day of the blizzard in Chicago uh, in 2011, brought a pair of boots for Paige. Paige had a brother in the shelter who was autistic, and he used these bionicle toys to relax in the shelter. And so I tweeted out there, I need bionicle toys for a 10-year-old homeless boy. I had people from around the world send me bionicle toys to help this young guy kind of stay calm while he was in the shelter. Um, a woman, Diana Zook in California, wrote a song about me. She sent um, bionicle toys to this young man. So, I realized that I could help other people, and from there I realized that really small things can matter. If I can identify, or if we can identify a small need in a certain group of people, as they become homeless, right at the edge of homelessness, if we can satisfy that need, we can change their life in a big way. So the Adler School of Psychology gave me some interns, and those interns have been working on a study that we're going to try and get a university to undertake, and we're working with the university to actually try and change the intake form in shelters. So that when someone comes in, they just don't ask them if, you know, they're bipolar or if they're, you know, an alcoholic. They actually ask them a series of questions to see if they have a small need, like maybe if we pay their rent or if we um, get their car payment made or, you know, negotiate with the landlord to get this small need filled, to get them back out of their situation. Because if you're homeless after three weeks, there's tons of programs for you, but it might be too late to get into that program because the landlord doesn't want to, you know, work with you anymore or... Um, you, uh, you can't get your job back, even though we got your car fixed. So that's where that led, and that's what I started to do. And I mean, I was homeless um, in December 2010, and, and within five months, I'm starting to do this stuff. Now I work for an organization called the Help Institute. Dr. Dominica McBride and Stephen Cofrancesco, two people that I've become great friends with who believe in me, have allowed me to become their director of development, and we work in the inner city in Chicago, in Auburn Gresham, and in Phoenix, Arizona. And what we do is we use program evaluation to amplify the impact of nonprofits in communities that need servicing, basically, and we do it for free. My job is to kind of be a magnet and bring as many people to the organization as I can so we can do that work. It is amazing to me that the power of Twitter, finding meaning and sharing in Twitter. Last night we were at the um, Twitimentary um, screening. And Jeff said that there are still people out there that think this is about tweeting about lunch. Um, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be on this stage. I might still be homeless without Twitter. Had I not been able to talk to the world and develop my ideas 
without the folks from Twitter, it would have been, I'm not exactly sure where I would be. A week ago, I marched in Chicago against violence with a gentleman and his church, Father Flager, St. Sabina. This church is speaking out against violence in the community. There's cultural genocide going on across America in these communities, and we need to stand up and fight for these communities. I'm hoping some of you have read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Um, that book specifically speaks to what's going on in these communities. And now, after being homeless, I'm working to help folks in those communities. Um, it's an amazing thing to see what um, can happen if we get together and use technology. All of the folks in this room, all of the folks watching this probably have some great ideas that they can share with the people in Chicago, like Hip Hop Detox. If you look, if you're following me, if you look and see, I've put up some organizations up there that I'm working with, like Hip Hop Detox, like the Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation. There are people in Chicago that are working very hard to improve their communities, and what I would like to see is the minds and the hearts of people like you come to Chicago, literally, physically, come to Chicago. Don't bring your ideas to me and send them to me. Come to Chicago and create your ideas with these folks who are trying to make a difference in their own community. But physically come and see what it's like. Because when I worked in these communities 20 years ago, building houses for Habitat for Humanity, they were devastating places. Today, it's beyond the pale. What? these places are like. But what is amazing is the people that really are working incredibly hard, the resilience of these communities to really make a big difference in their life. And this technology that helped me do what I do, this technology coupled with the drive and the resilience of the folks in these communities can make a huge difference. I know Mark Horvath is a good friend of mine and he's talked about the Arab Spring. We need an Arab Spring in this country with technology. We need an Arab Spring in this country for homeless people, for poor people, for anyone that cannot have access to this. It needs to be free. It needs to be ubiquitous, okay? If we can get this technology out to people around the world and in these communities, they can speak for themselves. They can speak for themselves like I did. And they can find people to help them with their ideas. They don't need your ideas put on them. They need you to develop ideas with them because they're in these communities. These people, marvelous people in these communities, if somebody were to Google right now how many children died last year um, from gunshot violence in Chicago, I think it's somewhere about 100. Um, I think that this, this thing that's happening in these communities, most people are not even aware. And I don't think that people are aware of how much these people are fighting, how resilient they are and how they're fighting to lift this veil that holds them down, basically. Um, I think when I go into these communities, people feel forgotten. And I want everyone in this room, everyone that's listening to me speak, I want you to come to Chicago and community by community, develop relationships with these people. Use this technology that changed my life and help them, bring it to them so that they can do things that will transform themselves and the world. And when they have that knowledge, they'll be able to take that knowledge to the next community and pass that knowledge along. It's about the creativity and the minds in this room and the people watching this, bringing them, come to Chicago, follow me on Twitter, um, and let me introduce you to people who are really working very hard to change their lives. We need that Arab Spring in America. We need to change things. And um, <laughs> I hope I've uh, been coherent, and I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be here. And there are so many marvelous people that I have met here. Jeff Pulver, Megan Carberry, who helped connect, connect me with Jeff. I used to say that I'm so crazy, I think I can change the world. No. I can change the world. I'm changing the world. I'm working with people like you that can change the world. Don't let anybody tell you you can't change the world. And I want to wake up a really old man someday and say we changed the world. And I was homeless 
homeless two years ago, and I'm working to change the world, and I want you. Please come to Chicago and change the world with me. Thank you very much. Thank you.